On today's episode of the Mark Titus Show, college football week one is in the books and the entire country cannot stop talking about one thing, the top of the Big Ten standings where the Ohio State Buckeyes and the Rutgers Scarlet Knights both sit atop, both are, are in first place, both are undefeated, both have, do we have the two best defenses in college football, TJ? That's what people are saying, right? And That's the two all best the, quarterbacks too. The two best quarterbacks quarterbacks yeah everyone came away from the Ohio State game saying they definitely have an answer at quarterback they don't have to worry about that at all uh no what what, what most people are talking about if you're not if you're not uh dancing on Dabo or, or Brian Kelly's grave like I am which is um I cannot get enough of that that was like a perfect opening weekend for uh the hater in me um Obviously, Michigan losing would have been nice, but Dabo and Brian Kelly are my two least favorite coaches by a mile, by a mile in college football. Seeing them both lose in humiliating fashion was an absolute delight, and uh, I, I hope it happens every week. That's what I'm hoping for. I will be tuning in. I really enjoyed the first week of college football so much that I will be tuning in next week as well, and, and I hope to see the same thing. I hope to see both of those coaches eat shit again because I can't get enough of it. I hate them both. Um, but obviously the big story in college football is uh, the Colorado Buffaloes uh, taking the sport by storm. Um, the Dion haters are absolutely furious. They they are pivoting very hard. Um, it, it was it was a long summer of calling Deion Sanders a clown, saying that Colorado is a joke of a program to hire a guy. The AD comes out and says that uh, we don't even have the money to hire him, um, and everybody clowned him for that. The whole the, I don't mean to throw everybody into one group here because some people were like, hey, let's wait and see what happens. You know, Dion did have success at, at uh, Jackson State, so let's pump the brakes a little bit. But, boy, it did, it did – it sure did feel like a lot of people thought this is going to be an absolute disaster. Colorado comes out, beats TCU, uh, a team that was playing for a national championship, beats them on the road in week one. Uh, Ryan Konigsberg is a, the host of the DNVR Buffs podcast, which is a, a, a great little uh, Colorado football podcast. He does all Colorado sports, but Colorado football uh, podcast. I've, I've known of Ryan for a while, and uh, every so often when Colorado's relevant, I'll pop in and listen to him uh, talk about the buffs, but, you know, obviously, football-wise, has not been the case for a very long time. Uh, they're relevant again. So I, I reached out to Ryan to have him on the show. We're going to talk about uh, 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 not only the win over TCU, but what the what the summer's been like, what Colorado football was like before Dion, because uh, this is a guy who's covered this team before Saturday. <laughs> a lot of people are going to be paying attention uh, moving forward, but he's a diehard CU fan, and he does the uh, DNVR Buffs podcast. Uh, which is great. So uh, as, as Dion continues to rack up W's, go listen to Ryan. We'll have fun talking to him. Also, the United States lost to Lithuania in the FIBA World Cup that literally nobody is watching. Nobody. Um, but everybody saw that. We, they saw that we lost to Lithuania. Uh, we are not knocked out. We are still playing in this thing. We just beat the snot out of Italy. We are now on to the Final Four. Uh, we will play the winner, winner of Germany and Latvia. But, I, you know, maybe I'll talk about that a little bit. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Do people care? I don't know. I'll, see, I'll, I'll start talking about it. And then about halfway through, I'll realize nobody cares. And I'll hit the bail. I'll hit the bail button and we'll get out of it. But uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Also, I want to talk about this ACC. Uh, Cal, Stanford, and SMU joining the ACC. Um, I, got, I got some thoughts on that that I, want, that I want to hash out before we get to to Ryan Konigsberg. A little hodgepodge show, trying to touch a little bit of everything going on in the sports world. Uh, fun conversation with, with uh, Ryan Konigsberg coming up. Let's get into it. All right, before we uh, talk a little Colorado football, uh, before we talk about really anything else, uh, mostly sports. Brandon Walker and I doing our show, our live show on YouTube. Um, we have a time. We have announced a time. Um, for those of you that live in the Barstool universe and consume a lot of Barstool content, you might have been aware that there was a controversy as to what time we might go. Um, Brandon and Rico got into a fight on the case race on the yak. Uh, in the end, the dust settled, cooler heads prevailed, and we are going to be doing our show at 10 Eastern, 9 Central, uh, in the AM every single morning, Brandon and I, uh, Monday through Friday, uh, starting on Tuesday, September 12th, we will be going live. So go, go subscribe to how, how, what do you just type in mostly sports? The, the link will be at the top of the description. There we go. It's a new channel, mostly sports channel with Mark Titus and Brandon Walker. I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. Brandon's great. Um, I, I, I do find that, that a lot of people hate one of, one of us, yes. you know, that's and good for the, that's show, good for I the think. show. Yeah. That's good for the show. I really like people are like, Titus is boring. I love BFW. He brings the juice. And then yeah. other people are like Brandon's a moron. And, 
I don't know what they say. About You've me, probably honestly. experienced this, but, but when people dislike you online and you work in like a sports show environment, you, some of your highest viewed episodes are when you're eating the most crow. Like w- yeah. when I used to work on our Yankees podcast, like our best viewed episode every year was the episode right after the Yankees get eliminated from the playoffs. Right. So if you guys can both channel having haters on either side of the same aisle, whether it's right. one week you like Arkansas and he doesn't, and then the next week, you know, he's flip. We'll have a million viewers every episode. That, that's right. That's right. That's how. I mean, that's how all these uh, other networks have cracked the code. Is they just pick an issue, flip a coin before the show, and yep. they're like, "All right, so you're pro Jordan, you're pro LeBron, go argue." And that's how. That's how it works. Um, yeah, my my. I think like the most watched thing I ever had before I I, I got into the barstool world yep. was uh, when Ohio State lost to Oral Roberts, right. and I was on a live stream. <laughs> just dying. People love watching people, people die on camera. Yeah. <laughs> um. No, that's it, it's a great dynamic, Brandon. Because we, we ha- I, 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 I love the chemistry we have. I love uh, uh, the way his brain works, and and but at the same time, we disagree about just about everything. So that that makes it fun. And and like I said, most people seem to like one of us and not the other. Yeah. And that that's a great combination. Because if you're Team Titus, watch the show and watch me dunk on Brandon. If you're Team Brandon, uh, I'll probably eat crow a lot, and and you'll get a pump your fist along with Brandon as he's making me also if you're team brandon why are you, why are you listening to my show why are you watching this right now you know team titus only you know what, what, what are you doing here get out you, you've come to the wrong place get out of here this is a team titus space uh mostly sports though starting next tuesday uh very excited about that tj will be working on it he'll be our producer it'll be live we will put it on a podcast feed so if you're a podcast person and uh you don't want to watch live um you can still listen you'll still be able to watch obviously on demand but uh we're, we're really going to lean into the live element of it all and i think uh as the show progresses and we start to figure out what works and what doesn't, um, you know, the, the, there will be elements that will probably be heavily influenced by the live nature of it, if that yep. makes sense. We'll be taking callers, I'm sure, at some point. We'll be, you know, live reacting to news, all that sort of thing. So I encourage people to watch live if you can. But if not, it'll be a podcast and it'll be on YouTube forever. So uh, there you go. Before we, we, we talk to Ryan Konigsberg, um, I have some thoughts on on Cal and Stanford uh, and and SMU to the ACC that I want to talk about because this is it kind of like flies under the radar. This not really, but at this point in time, like realignment is already you know like the first cuts the deepest, and once once UCLA and USC join the Big Ten, I think at that point um, you're just kind of like numb to this sort of thing. And and we've spent so much time leading up to the start of football talking about the the, the conference realignment going on that uh, I think Cal, Stanford, and SMU joining the ACC at a time when football is about to kick off, I guess week zero, it already happened. Um, it doesn't really move the needle for people. They're like, whatever. I don't care. It's, it's, this is all already, it's all, all, I can't be surprised anymore. And plus there's real football on. So I'm going to watch that. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to bring it up because, uh, I, I knew it was coming. I knew, um, you know, like there were reports out there that, that the ACC was interested in this and this might be happening. I mean, I, I think I talked about it on a show not too long ago that I said these are the rumors. We'll, we'll see what comes to fruition. And when it does, we'll talk about it then. Now it has come to fruition. And uh, it's a bummer for me because I, I'm not going to like shit on the ACC and say that it was stupid to do this. Um, you know, or they're ruining college sports. I'm not going to clutch my pearls anymore. I've already done that about all these other moves. Uh, the, the time for pearl, pearl clutching is, is over. Uh, this certainly doesn't, if you're someone who's okay with every other move in conference realignment, but damn it, this one is the one that we were like, this is disgusting. Uh, I don't know. You, you're, you're a very rare breed. I'll put it that way. But it's sad for me because I think the writing is very clearly on the wall that the ACC is done and the ACC is the preeminent. Now, Big East fans will tell me to pump my brakes, but the ACC is the preeminent college basketball conference historically. It is it is the conference um, I think of, certainly, when I think of college basketball conferences. Now, again, Big East fans would say we had you know a great run and you don't understand our rivalries. I, I, I get the Big East point of view. I think the ACC's history going back uh, as, as far back as it does, the, the programs that, that um, have, have been in that conference and just like growing up, not an ACC guy. I just found myself gravitating towards the ACC. The ACC was like a national conference and the big East was great. And I respect the hell out of the big East. And I love the big East. Even the current big East is, is an incredible basketball league. And I'm, I'm excited for it this, this upcoming season. But the ACC to me was like the national basketball conference. It was, it was the, the conference for everybody to like everybody that if you're a PAC 12 basketball fan, 
you were still watching a lot of ACC basketball. If you're a Big 12 basketball fan, you're still watching ACC, a lot of ACC basketball. I don't know for sure if that was true with the Big East. Now, the Big East had a lot of great uh, teams, a lot of great years where, you know, they'd have uh, X number of top 10 teams, top 25 teams. The Big East, what, what made the Big East so great in its heyday was the regional rivalry aspect of it. And I think those rivalries were respected nationally, but they didn't – like like Duke Carolina – I feel like you, you you could you could pull kids that are are growing up in like Vegas and ask them do you like Duke or Carolina and they have opinions on that. Whereas like a Syracuse UConn game, say that's not I, I never cared when I was growing up. I, I I loved the rivalry. I cared about the I cared about the game. I wanted to watch. If you asked me if I'm more UConn or Syracuse, I was like I don't I don't know. I've never really given it much thought. Duke Duke and Carolina was a rivalry that was like you draw the line in the sand. And even kids in Indiana were like I I like Duke or I like Carolina. Uh, Same with Maryland. Maryland would play Virginia or Maryland would play Duke or, you know, and like you're either like, I like this. I like what Maryland represents in the ACC. I don't like what Maryland. Now Maryland's obviously in the big 10, but um, I'm just speaking like on the historical scale of this, the ACC to me was college basketball and this move adding Cal and Stanford and SMU to the ACC, um, not to shit on these programs too much, but this is a desperation move, both from them and from the ACC. It's pretty. It's pretty obvious that that uh, that that the, that the ACC, at a time when the, you you need to build your football brands, obviously to survive. Um, I, I I don't really. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm in two minds about it because like I I think if the ACC sat pat and did nothing, they're they're screwed. They had to do something. They had to the the writing was on the wall. Florida State and Clemson have been begging to get out of this conference for a while now. They're going to find a way to get out um, before the grant of rights is up. Uh, so like the the ACC sees what's going on and that there's a football arms race. They are severely behind this arms race. Adding Cal and Stanford and SMU is not going to to move the needle in, in that regard. Um, but I think that like. What I was hoping for, because they they had to do something, but what I was hoping for was more of like a concentrated um, approach to this. That and maybe this is the, I'm splitting hairs at this point because maybe it was just inevitable at all times that the ACC was just not going to survive uh, the conference realignment in the end. But what I was what I would have hoped for is saying, all right, we're not going to win the football arms race. There's there's no way we can do this. But what if we can kind of like copy what the Big Twelve seems to be doing, which is like the Big Twelve is building like a a basketball super league. The ACC is college basketball historically. It's it's not been as great in recent years, but you know it, the, the cachet is still there. The ACC is still still moves the needle uh, and it, from a basketball perspective. If you're going to add teams, because you you do have to add teams apparently to, to, to show that you're strong and, you know, <laughs> we, we are growing. We are not losing teams. We're not bleeding. Um, if you're going to add teams, I think that the, you, you take one of two approaches. You either, you either go for the basketball side of this uh, where you say, I, we're going to, we're going to build basketball brands. We're going to try to identify maybe add Gonzaga, you know, like that's, that's crazy. That's if you're going to go crazy and get West coast teams, maybe extend an invitation to Gonzaga um, maybe try to poach like some of the big East schools, maybe try, I don't know, but you're just, just go, go at it from a standpoint of like, we are basketball. Let's lean into the basketball side of things. Let's try to survive that way. Um, or, and, or, and slash, or I think there needed to be some, uh, uh, emphasis on regionality where, um, try to, as the rest of the country is, is growing or the rest of the conferences in the country are just going coast to coast, and and it, the Big Ten is is absurd at this point. Instead of trying to like be a lesser version of the Big Ten, tighten up a little bit, circle the wagons, and say like we are the ACC, we are like the we are we're basically like they to me like the ACC kind of represented the South, but like it was like more of the 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 better school, like it was like the 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 prestigious schools of the South. Where like, if I was an ACC fan, I imagine at some point I probably looked at the SEC and I was like, "You guys are good at football, yes, but all of your alums of all your schools are morons." Whereas those of us that went to Virginia and those of us that went to North Carolina and those of us that went to Duke and and Wake Forest, we are elites. And what, what I, whatever whatever that identity is, like lean into that. Try to figure out like what that is. Um, Maybe in the end it would have been futile anyway, but like adding adding Cal, Stanford, and SMU does does nothing other than just create a a, a conference that is coast to coast. But unlike the Big Ten, who also did this, uh, the Big Ten is 
going to make money hand over fist. They also have multiple teams on the West Coast other than just Cal- – when the Big Ten added, added USC and UCLA, that was, that was so stupid because those two schools now have to play East Coast all the time. Then you had Washington, Oregon. Weirdly, it like kind of made sense to that, that's suddenly not as weird because now you got four schools on the on the West Coast that it makes scheduling actually a little bit easier. If now that you have a larger group of teams on the West Coast, I don't know what this solves basically from the ACC other than just to say we are doing something um, and and signify to the rest of the schools in the ACC that we're not dead yet. But at the same time, uh, Carolina, Clemson, and Florida State all voted against this. I think it's very clear that they're out. They won out. They're they're going to be out the second they can jump. Um, and basically, Cal, Stanford, and SMU are the backfill for this. Uh, I don't once once Carolina, Clemson, and FSU leave, uh, the floodgates are open. The ACC is done, and I think it's worth just kind of pausing. I know football just got underway. I know nobody gives a shit about this anymore. You just want to talk about the sports that are going on in front of your in front of your face. Uh, but I'm sad because like I, I see this as an act of desperate I see it as an act of desperation from Cal and Stanford, by the way, who I don't think needed to do this. I don't think they needed to join a conference. I actually expected them to not join a conference. Maybe there's still a world where they'll, they they are hopeful that they'll get the Big Ten invite eventually when the ACC dissolves. I thought Cal and Stanford were just gonna sit on their hands, shrug their shoulders, say, We don't need a conference anyway. We don't really care about sports that much anyway. And then maybe there was a world down the line where the Big Ten would invite them for the academic, the research. Um, all that sort of thing, and and then they would get they would they would accept that invite. I don't know why they would go to the ACC. I don't know why the ACC would want them. It just reeks of desperation from all sides, and it makes me sad. And it's worth pointing out, and and uh, at, at a time when no one cares, and and week one is underway. Um, I want to point it out because I just I just see the writing on the wall that that the great the the best basketball conference historically. Uh, is is on its deathbed in my estimation. Now I I don't know how much longer it's you know I, the grain of rights is still a thousand years away from expiring. So we'll see. I guess I don't know. Maybe the maybe Clemson and Carolina and FSU have to stick around and they can't f- figure their way out. But it's just a matter of time, and that is that is an absolute bummer to me because uh you know obviously obviously Carolina Duke is at stake. I think they're still going to play once a year even if they they did end up in separate conferences they would still figure out a way to play it i know but um yeah it's just sad and it's something that i think uh uh most people are just gonna shrug their shoulders and not care that much about because we've already broken the the the, the dam has already been broken and this doesn't really the acc these acc moves aren't really going to shake up the college football landscape that much so it's not worth talking about that much uh in that regard but from a basketball standpoint it's a huge freaking bummer and um yeah, that's it, and and I and I just keep going back to what uh, what Jeff Schwartz and I talked about, where where, Cal, where the the Pac-12 is now down to two schools, which means that ten schools, ten schools in the Pac-12 were deemed desirable enough for power conferences to say we want you, you you move the needle by adding you you will move the needle, and yet those twelve banded together couldn't figure out a way to sustain. Sustain them. So it, that part of it breaks my brain. That part is like, I don't know. In a weird way, it makes me hopeful that like maybe there is there is a chance down the line that these schools revive the Pac-12 in like forty years. You know that they all everybody goes their separate ways, goes to the conferences, uh, goes to their new conferences. They all have like varying levels of success, but they all have like brands that that matter to people nationally. And then they all look at each other and say, "Should we should we run this back and get the Pac-12 back together?" That would be pretty sick. So, I'm rooting for that. But uh, yeah, bummer bummer to see that happen. I did, I mean, good for SMU, I guess. I guess that's the one. If there's one like positive out of all, if there's if there's one thing that I feel like somebody won, because I I feel like the ACC lost. I feel like Cal lost. I feel like Stanford lost. Um, the ACC, I guess, had to do something. So in that regard, I. I don't know. Maybe they didn't lose. They just delayed their loss a little bit longer. But um, it 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 tells me this is a very desperate move. Uh, and and SMU would be the one the one winner out of all this, I guess. SMU is is now going to be in the ACC. SMU's had a good basketball program, by the way, at times. Like that would be that would that would be cool. But Cal, Cal it, it solves nothing. Cal and Stanford solve absolutely nothing. It creates more problems. Um, and it just it it puts a band aid on a bullet wound. And unfortunately, I don't think that's uh. That's going to be the answer. So uh, that's really it, and, and I'm bummed out about it. But uh, enough about that. Let's talk to Ryan Konigsberg about the uh, about this 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 rise of Deion Sanders, the rise of Colorado football. Have they won the national championship already? Is Colorado should we just end the season? Is the, 
I like how the, the Dion haters did. The Dion haters were like, this is a joke. This guy won't win anything. I can't wait till they start 0 and 6. Then Colorado wins one game. And then suddenly, this is why I love haters because there, there, there was no like, ah, oh, shit, I was wrong. It's like pivot, pivot, pivot. Now all of a sudden, TCU sucks. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, okay, it was one game, but that doesn't mean – it's like one game. They won one game last year. They've already matched their win total. <laughs> they just yeah. beat the team that was playing for the national championship. I don't. If you're a Deion hater, you're a loser at this point. You lost. The game is – like Colorado could lose every single game the rest of the year by 50. He's already won. He's already made a huge impact on Colorado football. You've lost. Pack it up. Find a new pr- – can I suggest Brian Kelly and Davo? Those are, those are great coaches to hate. Hate them. I, I we, that that hater bandwagon will never be full enough. Uh, please join me. I will. I will show you the way. Uh, but at this point, Dion, silence the haters. Um, but at the same time, I want to talk to Ryan about uh, where Colorado goes from here and what the expectation should be and all that. So uh, here it is. Uh, conversation with Ryan Konigsberg. All right, joining me now is Ryan Konigsberg, uh, DNVR Buffs podcast. He's a he's a CU alum, and he is, as I said earlier in the show, he is a guy who was paying attention to Colorado football before Saturday, which uh, is is a rarity that makes you one of how many people, <laughs> Ryan? How many people? <laughs> the bandwagon's getting full. Oh, yeah, it, it's a little crazy now, and it's funny because you know, the, like Colorado has a good, good fan base, um, but it's been beaten down for so long that like. Last year was honestly the last straw for a lot of people. So like the the bandwagon got extra extra small after last yeah. year, one and eleven. Like I had friends cancel their season tickets, and now they can't get them back. <laughs> Whoops! Terrible, uh, terrible investment <laughs> there. Um. So what have the, what have the last few days been like for you, just personally as a guy who's like so invested in this program? Um. And and, and I you you were at the game right at TCU. You went to the game. Um, yes, sir. What just, yes, sir. just walk you me probably hear my voice a little bit crackly. <laughs> walk me through the emotional whirlwind that uh you know from take me from like Friday night to now and and what that's been like for you as a CU bus fan. Yeah, I'll take you back even a little bit further just to set the stage here. Um when Coach Prime got hired, you know, we didn't realize like the cultural phenomenon that comes along with him. It's not just buffs fans were re-energized it's coach prime fans from all around the country are now deeply invested in colorado football so you know we we do shows here at dnvr every day but we were doing the buff show live like once a week we were like we got to start doing this live every single day because Mm -hmm. the the uh, the audience honestly went from like a hundred to ten thousand overnight um so we're talking about this all off season you know and you, there's so much talk and every transfer that comes in, we break them down and we're talking about this so much. And you start to just like question, like, is it really going to live up to the hype? You know, like you want to trust coach prime so much because everything he says is he says with such conviction and he has so much swagger and you're like, all right, now that we're getting close to the actual game coming, like, God, I hope they deliver because we've been hyping up this team you know, for six months now. So honestly, like them delivering and living up to everything that we thought they could be was incredible. Um, But the best part of it all was being in the stands with my buddies who, you know, we've been watching Colorado football forever, who like weren't quite there yet. Like, you know, I was a little bit further down the road because I've been a little bit closer to the program. And they're just like, I don't know, man. Like, how are we going to turn this around from one and 11 last year and then just be good right away? Like I- I'm all in on coach prime, but I just don't know if it's going to be that soon. And so like looking around, looking in the stands at my, at my buddies as like Travis Hunter is doing something remarkable or Shador is dropping another perfect dime. Like their minds just being blown was, was really, really cool. And, you know, I just think after the game was, it was just fun to like have it all pay off and you yeah. know get to go dig up the receipts of people who didn't believe. <laughs> Boy, are there a lot. There was there was a, yeah. a ton of skepticism nationally. What was the I mean you kind of touched on it right there, but like what was the the skepticism? Um were, were there haters in Boulder? Were there haters did, do you know of people that were like this is this is not going to work or was it just like cautious optimism? Like how would you describe uh the, the overall set from, from the moment Deion Sanders is hired to when you actually see the on-field product, um, your, your sense of the fan base, was it just full steam ahead? We love this guy. We believe in him or yeah. 
It, it was. Um, and I think what people have to realize about why that happened is because of how down bad the program was. Like, yeah. we were looking for anything, any semblance of hope. Um, and you see, like, the way that college football has turned in just the last couple of months. Like, I remember feeling, and I think I even tweeted it out after they fired Carl Durrell, like, this next hire is the most important hire in program history because college football is about to change dramatically. You've got all this conference realignment happening. And so like CU fans were as down bad as a fan base can possibly be. And like, honestly worrying about what even is the future of the program? Is there a future of the program? Um, so the second that, that coach prime gets hired, like everyone's on board. And I, I remember seeing a lot of people, saying stuff like i just don't know if he's a cultural fit in boulder or if people <laughs> yeah. are going to rally around him and i'm just like yeah, yeah no one cares like yeah, no everyone one cares. just wants to win at any cost yeah as it turns out like the the culture of boulder is the same as the culture of every other place in america which is we just want to like win and be relevant and that's it and as long as we yes. do that like we don't care who <laughs> we don't need a granola hippie you know from cut from the boulder cloth co coaching our team we just need a guy who can bring some juice to the program and he did that that's why i was I, I was saying, like, whenever I would get asked about it all summer, I was like, I don't know how much he actually has to win. I think the fact that, that people spent the summer, if you were doing, like, a college football show, you were talking about Deion Sanders this summer. You were talking about the Colorado Buffaloes football program that won one game last year that has not, you know, been been great. You know, they're, they're, in the 90s, Colorado had good teams or whatever, but it's been a while since Colorado's popped nationally. And just that alone, if Deion would have – there's still a lot of football left to be played, but if – Hell, if he win three games this year, it's already he's already kind of won or already kind of like done what he's been hired to do, which is just like reinvigorate the program, right? Isn't that like a fair? Yes, a hundred percent. I mean, they won within weeks after hiring Coach Prime. Like, like the merch sales were off the yeah. charts. They sell out the spring game. Like, I remember reading an article a couple of weeks ago that was like the Coach Prime uh, experiment will be a failure in Boulder, and I was like, ah, you're missing the point. It was already successful. Like, yeah. if Coach Prime took a job at you know to go coach the, you know the 49ers tomorrow, we would look back at the Coach Prime era right. in Colorado and say that was a success. <laughs> right, 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 right. Which is wild to say because he's only won one game. So I guess. Uh, after, after now that you've seen the team on the field, um, how how have your expectations changed? And and have your expectations changed? And if they have, how have they changed? For for enough about the hype, just like what this team can be, what this Colorado Buffaloes team can be between now and the end of the season. Yeah, it's funny because you know people that know me will tell you like I am the single most optimistic person about. Colorado football that there that that there will ever be, um, and you know even through the darkest of times I was like ah maybe we can find a way to six like I'm seeing the path, um, and what what's crazy about so far with Coach Prime is like every single thing he's done has exceeded I think even the highest of expectations uh, that happen at least within the fan base the, like the true fan base it's like okay we know he's going to be able to recruit oh he goes and gets the number one transfer portal class it's like oh wow he's really recruiting you know everything he's done so like we did our show uh, the last show before the season started and I was like you know I think like I see this team going six and six and I felt like that was very optimistic right, at the time right, and now right. you look at that and it's like well somehow they're already ranked number 22 in the country and like six wins almost feels low so like it's a constant sliding scale where now that i've seen the product on the field honestly from a football standpoint i'm just like okay well they're gonna be able to score with just about anyone mm -hmm. um that offense is high powered they've got speed they obviously have the quarterback um they have issues like it's not like they're a perfect team you know i think there's going to be some teams that run the ball on them. And maybe if the pass rush gets cooking on the other side, it might make things tough, but we're talking about, you know, a pack 12 that has a lot of good teams and a lot of good quarterbacks, but I don't see powerhouse other than Utah is obviously, you know, a, a different breed, I think in the pack 12. And then you have USC with Caleb Williams, who is always, who is kind of a similar team to Colorado in that they have all the offensive explosion and problems on defense. So now as I look through it, I'm like, okay, I don't think there's a single game that you completely count them out of after what you saw from an offensive standpoint from them. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm starting to feel like six, it might be low. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how that works. Right. And and it's also funny how weirdly that's enough. Like just, just having a team, I imagine when, once you've watched a, a one and 11 team and I went to, 
I went to the Colorado USC game last year, and I think Colorado like hung around for a little while. But um, yeah. boy, boy, that 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 was yeah. They were a bad football team, and they, even like just watch. I, I it always cracks me up when you watch like a a, a team that's not a good football team warming up versus a, a team that's not good and just like it's night and day how big and fast and I, football is one of those sports where but basketball it doesn't always work that way um yeah but football is like a what i call the airport test ryan where you could just watch two football teams walk through an airport and you can point out the better football team immediately and that's how i felt watching colorado and usc last year i was like yeah that team is that looks like a high school team compared to those guys um but now that we're here just going into a game every single week and thinking we have a chance that I imagine that's, that's all you really need. And, and whether, and that's kind of where I'm at with it as, as a guy who doesn't care one way or another, if Colorado wins is I imagine that if, yeah, you, you, you play USC and Oregon coming up here, you lose both of those games. Say like, I still think you're, you're coming out of that saying we're fine for the rest of the season, which I imagine for you, that's all you really could have dreamed of in year one of the, the coach prime era. A hundred percent. And it's so funny because, you know, coach prime has all these supporters everywhere. And he also has like all these haters who can't stand the guy. Uh, and throughout the off season, they're saying like all this hype just to win three games or like some people said like, LOL, they're only going to go six and six, like calm down. I'm like, bro, if they go six and six, I will be crying. Like I'll actually <laughs> shed tears when they win the sixth game to clinch yeah, bowl yeah. eligibility. Like you don't understand where we yeah. come from. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I bet you if you ask a lot of Colorado fans, we have, you know, Nebraska this week and Colorado State next week. They'll tell you if you win, if you beat Nebraska and you beat Colorado State, like I'm good. Yeah. Um. It, it, and obviously the expectations are going to expand after that. People are going to want more and more and more as they always do. But uh, like you said, like just the fact that they're relevant, they're exciting. They have like legitimate playmakers who make it exciting to tune in every week is more than enough. So how did, how did, uh, help me understand how like Colorado got in this position from, from your vantage point. Like how did, not, not just last season being that bad, but, um, you know, I, I I know there have been decent seasons here and there through the years, and I don't mean to say that that Colorado has put out a one and eleven football team every single season. Um, but, pretty close, but pretty yeah. Like <laughs> like how how does that happen? How does the team win a cha- a national championship in in nineteen ninety? Uh, end up being in this position where you're saying if they win three games, you're already you're already like that's a, that's a hell of a season for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. I want to ask how long do you have? Cause I could, you know, (laughs) we could go way back and go through all the, you know, the, the notes here, but the big thing is in the early two thousands, they were good. Uh, They won a big 12 championship in 2001. You know, they beat Nebraska who was like number two in the country, 62 to 36. Um, It was a huge thing. They just missed out on going to the national championship that year. Actually, Nebraska ended up going, which was crazy because they just beat the brakes off them. Um, And, then there was a scandal uh and the coach at the time gary barnett was caught in the midst of it uh and you know there was all sorts of allegations being thrown around and recruiting violations and all of that stuff that just made them be like okay well we have to we have to get rid of gary barnett we got to start from scratch um they fired the athletic director too or actually the athletic director stepped down and they basically went started from scratch and at the time they thought they got like the home run hire in Dan Hawkins, who was of course the coach at Boise state when they upset uh, Oklahoma and the Fiesta bowl and all that. And so they kind of like thought they got the, the home run hire turned out he was a fraud. Um, You know, it was uh, Peterson uh, who obviously everyone knows now he was kind of the brains behind the operation. So he takes over Boise state. They stay good. Colorado falls back. And a lot of Colorado fans will tell you like, Dan Hawkins came in and just wanted to do everything his own way and like completely kind of ignored the traditions of the school, Mm. um, was like turning away program greats that like wanted to come, uh, you know, hang out on the sideline for games um, and kind of like took the soul out of Colorado football a little bit because I I think mostly because of his ego. Um, So that whole thing is funny looking back on it now because like they were like five and seven every year. Um, And at the time, a team that was bowl eligible or competing for the big 12 every year. Like that was like an, an, an epic failure. So they fire him and everyone says, okay, we got to get back to the tradition. Like we, you know, we, we got to, you know, like, uh, 
Bill McCartney, who's the best coach in program history, said the pride and tradition of the Colorado Buffaloes will not be entrusted to the timid or the weak. And so, like, mm. that's everyone's like, you know, posting that every day. Like, <laughs> yeah. we got to get back to the pride and tradition of the Colorado Buffalo. So um, they had to, you know, as a lot of places do when they're down bad, they they go back into the alumni and they're like, OK, well, who, who that played here can come coach us. Um, and John Embry, who was a, an assistant coach on Barnett staff, had gone to um, UCLA, had a bunch of success there as an assistant coach. Uh, and Eric Bienemy, funny enough, mm. um, who's one of the greats at Colorado, uh, was also with him at UCLA. So it was like down to those two. Funny, they were both like assistant coaches at UCLA. Is like, are we going Embo or are we going Eric Bienemy? Uh, they end up hiring Embry, bring in Bienemy as his offensive coordinator. Um, and kind of just thought like, oh, like they're going to be able to use these recruiting chops. Well, <laughs> to be fair to them, they had no time. Um, they were terrible right off the bat, worse than they ever were with Hawkins. And uh, the wheels kind of fall off. They fired Embry um, almost immediately. And then, like I said, how much time no, do you no, have? No, keep going. This uh, is great. I, <laughs> okay. I, don't, I think there are a lot of people that, that knew, knew none of this, myself included, knew very little of this stuff. So this is great. So they go – so they go two and 10 with Embry uh, in his second season and they're just like, okay, well, this isn't working either. So they fire him. Um, one of the craziest moments of my media career is they gave him a post firing press conference, like at the team facility, um, which I don't know whose idea that was, but they're like, we fired John Embry come here from him at 10 30 AM. We're like, what? Why would he do so, that? Why would Embry want to do that? Why would he not just, well, he was fired up, man. So he showed up there like angry. Um, uh, and like, I remember his wife and kids were there like yelling at the athletic director. It's one of the craziest things. They're what? like, you didn't give him enough time. Like you promised us all this time. It was, it was incredible. Oh my God. Um, so yeah, so they end up, uh, letting go of him and they bring in Mike McIntyre um, who actually had a little bit of success. Like he comes in and he's like, I'm not signing a contract unless you guys upgrade the facilities. Um, and so, you know, the, he gets it built into his contract that they have a whole facilities rebuild, which are the facilities that you're now seeing like coach prime blow up all over the place, showing off how great they are. Um, and turn it around a little bit, got back to like that five and seven area. They had one great season in 2016. Um, and then, shortly thereafter they actually started uh five and oh and like ev all, all the hype is around them and they're up i believe 31 to 3 on oregon state to clinch bowl eligibility and go six and oh they're ranked uh and they blow the lead in the second half um and not only do they go on to lose that game but they go on to lose every game for the rest of the season <laughs> Uh, completely derails all the momentum they have. Their best oh, player, no. LaVisca Schnault, like, uh, gets banged up. All You know, everyone, there's infighting in the coaching staff. The fans are losing their minds. There's loss after loss after loss. And every week, it's just like, okay, well, if we could just win next week, we're going to a bowl. <laughs> they lose seven in a row to end the season. McIntyre gets fired. I, I, you want me to keep going? Dude, I mean, I, <laughs> like, th th this, is, this is, yeah, very informative. I mean, I, I know the Mel Tucker part of it. I know yep, that so part of it. Yeah. So yeah. Mel Tucker was next and they really nailed it. Like Rick George, who's the athletic director still, um, nailed the hire. Uh, and, and you know, he wanted to bring in someone who knew yeah. how to market the school and all the things, honestly, that you say when you hire coach prime, just like coach prime times a thousand, but Mel Tucker brought in a lot of that same thing. He brought swagger back to the university. He, he brought confidence into the locker room and, it worked, you know, and they, and they, you know, they only win five games in his first year, but it was clear, like he was winning recruiting battles. Like they're going the right way. Of course, after tweeting out that he was staying, yeah, uh, yeah. he leaves a, a donor event where he like announced he was staying and said, Hey, we need support to get to the next level. He leaves that answers a call in the phone, uh, 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 answers the phone in, uh, in the car on the way out and uh takes the michigan state job and you know like you know everyone around here calls him midnight mel because like he left <laughs> left at midnight while we were all asleep we woke up he was gone um and they were left in a really bad position after that because mel tucker leaves to michigan state like late in the process yeah um 
it, it wasn't, you know, right after the season, they had kind of, I think it was just a couple of weeks away from signing day, if I remember correctly. And their hands were tied. They like went and tried to get Steve Sarkeesian. He just like used them for a raise at Alabama. Uh, and so finally Rick George was just like, okay, well, Carl Durrell, like he won a couple of games at UCLA when he was there, he's going to be bring a stability. He actually has a house in Colorado. So like, we know he likes it here. Like let's just get someone to say yes. Um, and he came in and obviously it was just, he, he didn't really bring the juice at all. And, uh, it, it was pretty rough. Um, you know, wasn't took the energy right out of the program. And so, um, a lot of people wanted Rick George to be fired and I, I kind of felt like that was unfair because his first, his first hire was Mel Tucker. I thought he knocked mm -hmm. that out of the park. Unfortunately, it didn't work out long-term the second one, he had his hands tied. So a lot of people wanted him fired, but you know, good on the university. They gave him another chance. And he said, I'm going to swing for the fences, try and leave a legacy here. So it's just a long list of, uh, just bad luck. Uh, just the wrong coaches. It, it, it really, it, it's, it's a story that a lot of programs I think can identify with, but, um, it's just more yeah. shocking for a program like Colorado to be at that level and fall. It, it so you're saying basically like, it wasn't a, it wasn't like a immediate fall. It was just like a gradual decline into, into the depths of hell until Deion Sanders arose, uh, 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 yeah, and just <laughs> saved the day basically overnight. Um, I guess I, I hate bringing this up, Ryan, but uh, the haters will, I, I, I'm sure, have have mentioned this many times to you. What about the scenario that Dion is just using this as a springboard? Do you even care? Have you even entertained that possibility? Have you entertained the thought that like you guys win ten games this year and then Dion leaves? Is it still worth it to you in the end? And I apologize for even bringing this up. I should not have done that. I shouldn't. I shouldn't bring this up <laughs> after one week. But uh, I'm, I'm just no. like I feel like you guys have been through some emotional hell here, and I'm just trying to like prepare you for, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, it's funny. We, we've talked about that since the day he got here. And, you know, I guess if we, there's one thing we have to thank Mel Tucker for, it's like, we are now emotionally protected yeah, right. uh, from such things happening. Um, I don't think he sees it that way. Um, one thing I can be sure of is he's not going anywhere uh, after this year. Um, and, and the reason I, I shouldn't say I can be sure of it, but I'm pretty darn sure. Uh, and the reason is one, the buyout they have, you know, on the contract is, is huge. And the other thing is, you know, you, the way that college football works now, you get one free transfer, right? Um, so all of the guys that he brought with him, like a Shador, his son, uh, Shiloh actually has one more year of eligibility after this, although he's a grad. So that changes it. Travis Hunter has to play one more year. Like those guys wouldn't get a free transfer to go to another school. So he's going to be here at least to the end, uh, I think of Shador's career. And after that, like, there's no way we could look back on this and say, uh, yeah, I regret that that happened. Right, you know, right. it's like, yeah, we, we were dead in the water and coach prime comes in and, and brought back like just Colorado being cool. Like you just see around Denver uh, where I am right now, like people are wearing black and gold everywhere. Yeah. Um, and that hasn't happened in years. I, I was at um, a restaurant the other day and like, there's a table full of high school kids around next to me. And they're just like talking about the buffs. This is before they even played. They're just like talking about Colorado football. Like that, that has not been like that at all for a long time. So we will look back on this. Like I said, if he left tomorrow, we'd look back on it as a success. You guys could honestly like not play another game the rest of the year and just put out clips of Dion giving pep talks to the team <laughs> and just like Instagram posts of like the guys wearing the because like that was the other thing, the Colorado football team coming out in the all whites like that that was like cool as shit, dude. Like that was the. the I don't know how you could watch that game and not come away from it being like Colorado is very cool, which, as you said, is probably shocking to you guys because you're like, we have not been cool for a very long time. And suddenly you wake yep. up and you have the coolest football program in the country. Um, talk to me a little bit about the Nebraska rivalry. Um, the the You guys play Nebraska, obviously, on Saturday. Uh, what This is like the third time only since like 2010. This is a rivalry that's back. It has been put on the back burner. It has now been rekindled here. Um is this your number one rival still, would you say? And how much of a rivalry is it for, for you guys? Yeah, it's absolutely our number one rival. Um, Colorado State is the only one that even really exists. And obviously, you know, that one's clear. But um, it's been very one-sided, obviously, towards Colorado, pretty much most of the rivalry. Um, and it just, with them not being a Power 5 team, it doesn't hit the same. Nebraska has been the one for us forever. Um, I'll have you know that 
Nebraska has not beat Colorado in football in 4,666 days. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's the third matchup since 2010, but we got the last two. So it's been a long time for them. Uh, this one is, is kind of everything to us. Uh, and you know, it goes all the way back to the glory days where Bill McCartney just came in and was like, Hey, who's the best team in the conference right now? And they were like, Nebraska. He's like, cool. We fucking hate them now. <laughs> uh, and everyone was like, all right, we're on board. And like that, you know, that's basically the start of it, but they've, there's been some epic matchups and they used to play at the end of the season. So it all usually came down to the Nebraska game. Um, yeah, we hate them. We hate, we hate, is every, it, is it uh, like, hate it, them with every ounce. Is it like you watch Nebraska throughout the season? I mean, I guess you're playing them second game of the season now, but like, it, it, typically you watch them throughout the season just to, cause that like, that's how my, my perspective is Ohio. I'm an Ohio state guy. So like we, Ohio yep. state fans almost pay more attention to Michigan than at times. And sometimes Ohio state, it feels like, it feels like you're talking about like, yeah, did you see Michigan's game last? All right. They're looking better here. They're looking better, you know? And it's like, you're so keyed yep. in on that. Right. Would you say that's a, that's a fair way to describe the Nebraska Colorado rivalry for you? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I've been saying for a couple of years now, like my favorite team uh, hasn't been very good, but my second favorite team, which is whoever's playing Nebraska, has been pretty good for a few years. <laughs> so at least I have that going for me. Yeah, I mean, that's how it is. Like, it, like I turned on last Thursday uh, when they took on Minnesota, and like I was watching that like a diehard Minnesota fan. Like when they yeah. fumbled that game away and choked <laughs> like they always do, I was like, this is incredible. Like college football's back, baby. <laughs> Growing up in Indiana, um, Nebraska, Colorado, I, I was, you know, growing up in the nineties, it, it made it very easy, but Nebraska, Colorado had juice to me even like, I didn't, I didn't really care about either program either way, but like when Nebraska played Colorado in football, I was watching and I cared immensely about watching that game. Um, how much juice does it have right now? Would you say like going into Saturday, do you, do you feel like, like, give me a, give me a time frame of like when you've last felt this way about the Nebraska, Colorado rivalry going into a Saturday, like Where's the, where's the juice level at? We're all the way back to like 2001 levels of juice. Um, like I said, I, that, so that game in 2001 is when I fell in love with college football. I was nine years old. Um, and I had been to like buffs games and I liked the buffs and I was into it. Um, but I went to the game and I just remember like we pulled into the tailgating lot at like 6am. They were like, uh, sorry, like we're not open yet. Like my dad pulled out like a hundred dollar bill, gave it to the guy and was like, no, we're tailgating now. And they were like, all right, all right. So like, I, I, I feel like I can remember every step of that day. And like, I truly fell in love, um, from that day until today, I have been to 123 out of 125 home games or something wow. right around that number. So it was like, I was hooked for life. Yeah. Um, and so like, I just remember that was all anyone talked about uh, on the radio that week. That was all like we had Thanksgiving dinner the night before is all my family was talking about. There's like a couple people in my family that were Cornhuskers fans. Like we're just like fighting across the table. Like we're back. We're totally back to that level, uh, at least between the fan bases. Uh, you know, like the the online like back yeah. and forth <laughs> is like totally turned up to 11. I heard. um I heard on your last show or with Robbie Hummel, you were like, oh, like you deal with real media. I deal with like internet trolls. And right, I was right. like, oh, I see why he, he had me on. Like, right, yes, if you look right. at my timeline right now, it's just me trolling Nebraska That's fans. Why, so yeah. like we're uh, we're like all the way back. It's it's pretty cool. I actually think that the atmosphere at Folsom Field on Saturday is going to be unlike anything any Colorado fan has ever seen. Like, I really think we're all the way to that. That's awesome, man. That that fires me up. Uh, I have a soft spot for Colorado. Uh, personal connections to the city of Boulder, obviously, and also that uh the Village Coffee Shop. You're aware of this, right? You know the Village Coffee <laughs> oh. Shop, right? That's my favorite. Oh, yeah. That's my favorite diner in the world. I haven't been to every diner Let's in the go. world, but the, I've been there, and that is without question my favorite diner in the world. So I've always had a soft spot for uh, for CU, um, and and I've every time I go to Boulder, it just like it's the most beautiful place ever. And I just like sit there and yep. wonder like, why, why is this not, why is this school not better at stuff? And uh, my mind just keep, <laughs> I just keep going back to like, maybe the, maybe all the athletes are distracted. Maybe it's like, they're not in the gym working hard. <laughs> they just want to like go hiking and, you know, do some, whatever else. So it's, it's, I've never really been able to land on a great theory. Um, but you know, everything's trending in the right direction. The basketball program is good too, by the way, Colorado basketball, yes, a lot Cody of buzz. Williams. Yeah, a lot of buzz going yeah. uh, for Colorado. Tristan De Silva's back. Eddie Lampkin yep. transferring from TCU. 
um yeah colorado will be a ton of fun this year uh, uh for basketball as well so i'm fired up all, all of colorado sports man the nuggets are winning yeah. the abs are well not all the rockies are still still so, a joke but yeah where I'm sitting right now is inside what's known as the DNVR bar, um, which is we started our company DNVR, um, which is like a local media, all online, all digital outlet. And we ended up parlaying that into getting a bar. Um, and since we've had this bar, the abs have won a championship. The nuggets have won Let's a championship. Go. Like the, the I'll, I'll send you a video of the scene in here on Saturday when, when the buffs won, like, it's insane. So, um, yeah, it's been a, a great time to be a Colorado sports fan. That's awesome, man. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, appreciate you making time for me, Ryan. Uh, the DNVR, what, the, the, the CU Buffs podcast. That's the podcast. That's how people can listen. Um, yeah, if you if you look up DNVR Buffs or DNVR CU Buffs pod, uh, that's how you'll find us. Also, we're, we're on YouTube as well. There's a lot of uh, a lot of bandwagon people coming around. Are, are you are you good with that? Is that okay by you? Is or do you do you say hey, listen? If you weren't if you weren't a believer before Saturday, stay the hell away. <laughs> we're riding with the true believers. College football is built on support. Like you have to have support to win in college football. So I'm like, bring in everyone. And obviously, you know, doing a show makes it even better. Like there was legitimately shows last year that we did live that did a hundred viewers. Our post game <laughs> show on Saturday did over a hundred and thirty thousand viewers. Wow! Like wow! Like the, yeah. So yeah, come yeah, on, come, yeah, come all, on. Let's go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, enjoy the ride, man. Uh, both Saturday and the rest of the rest of the year. I, I might have to check back in with you uh, if Colorado's like eight and zero, you know. And we we might have to revisit these expectations you said when you would be fine with with six <laughs> wins. Uh, but no, it's it's been it's been really cool. Uh, it's been really cool the last few days to see uh, all the buzz and and best of luck the rest of the season. Season, both with the, the football team and the business you got going on and the show and everything, Ryan. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, next time you're in Colorado, come by the bar. We will do that. I will do that. I, I, I'm in Colorado all the time, so I will, I will definitely make that happen. And uh, hopefully I can I hopefully I can get in, man. You guys keep winning and everything. Oh, and yeah. The place is packed all the time. We got a spot. Yeah. We'll have a spot for you. All right. Thanks, Ryan. All right. See you, man. See ya. All right. Thank you to Ryan Konigsberg. Uh, that was fun. I felt like I learned a lot. He kept, uh, you could tell he's got like the thing that I have where like you start talking and you think like halfway through, you're like, no one gives a shit about this. Yeah. But he's like, should I keep, going? he's like, there's no, he's like, there's no world where anyone actually cares about the history of Colorado football coaches. Yeah. I was like, I, I do. I care. I don't know any of this because I don't want to like twist the knife too much, but Colorado football has been irrelevant for a very long time. And I don't know who was coaching and I don't yeah. know. He uh, is going through a very rare phenomenon in sports fandom, though, when you've reached the lowest of lows and then you have, like, the beacon of hope. Yes. And it's, like, after one week, paying off. And if right. it continues to pay off, you'll continue to ride that high and just want to tell everybody in your whole life about the history of Colorado football. Yeah, exactly. To exactly. let them know the darkness that you've been in. But but then it, you catch yeah. yourself and you're like, there's no way they care. But um, no, I, I cared. I cared. That was that was fascinating to me because because you you probably I hate that I keep doing this on this show. I, I, I it makes me sound like I'm a thousand years old when I'm just like you're probably not old enough to remember. No, but, yeah. Um, but having said that, you're probably not old enough to remember when Colorado was good, right? Like to you, the Colorado, Buffs were cool at one point. They were so cool. Cordell Stewart was so cool. Rashawn Salam was so cool. Um. They were very, very cool. They have not been cool for a long time. And now, in like the snap of a finger, it is crazy because there were, I, I mean, there were so, like, even when Dion was hired, he was a clown to so many people. Like, every, it, it is crazy how fast that happens. Yeah. And it's just like winning cures all. I guess that's really it. I guess if, if they would have lost, then maybe I would have been sitting down in this chair saying Dion's a clown, you know? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but there's something, what, what is it about that that like Dion Sanders, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's that it's that he's it's that he backs it up, I guess. But yeah. like, why if if any other coach was behaving this way? So I sort of get that the people that are like, I just don't like how cocky he is. I don't like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I understand the line of thinking, but I also, I I I can't get there, man, because I I I think it's just like the coolest thing in the world. I think that that I watched that that pregame speech he gave. Yeah, I watched that video a thousand times. I want to play for Colorado. I was, I, I did think though, how is he going to do this like twelve more times this right. year? Like, how did, did he use all his material? Dion has just like he's he's he talked gonna... such a big game for literally everything he's ever done in his whole life, mm -hmm. but he's backed up he backs every up every single time thing he said, aside from and, like the when he tried to start a high school, which that doesn't get brought that's up. True. But that's true. But like he every uh, single goal he set out, 
he's accomplished and then some. He's played two professional sports. He played three sports in college. Like, everything he's ever attempted, he's smashed. So when he said he wants to do, like, coaching football, people were like, you can't you coach can't do that. four stars and five stars at an HBCU. And he did that. Like, had Travis Hunter flip from Florida State to Jackson State. And then they're like, you can't make a 1-11 team good in one year. And they and beat a playoff team in week one, and they have two Heisman candidates. They have two Heisman candidates out of the gate. Yeah. I mean, when Travis Hunter committed to Jackson State, it was it was a joke. And it was yeah. like, well, we never, we'll never see this kid again. So congratulations on pissing away what was a promising football career, you idiot. You stupid idiot. We'll never, you know. <laughs> you look he, up played and, game, he played one game. He's like the greatest like, player <laughs> of all. I can't wait to play as him in the NCAA video game. He's no, going to be it's, so it's, sick. I think that's what it is. I think, like, yeah, Dion's cocky as shit. He talks the talk. You know, he's got the swagger, which, you know, is, is some people – um, are, are very turned off by that. Of uh, a coach should behave a certain way, and he doesn't fit inside that box. But at a certain point, just the results just beat you over the head over and over again, and you just have to succumb. If you're a hater, you just have to succumb at a certain point. You have to. If you're a Deion Sanders hater, there has to be a there has to be a point where you throw your hands up and you say, "I was simply wrong about this man." And I don't know how. It, it was just one game. I'm not trying to say they're national champions. I'm not trying to say you know that that. Shadur Sanders and, and Travis Hunter are going to be co-Heisman winners. Um, but, yeah, they won one game last year. They just beat the team that played for national championship. If you're a hater, you lo- you've you already lost. It's over. Move on. Um, anyway, speaking of haters and speaking of uh, things that nobody's interested in, um, the United States basketball team in this World Cup, uh, we lost to, to Lithuania. Um, very ugly game. Uh, very soft game. Very United States way to lose a basketball game. Uh, just getting destroyed on the boards. Um, getting frustrated and instead of like adjusting, um, just kind of like l- being baffled as to how they're, how we're going to go about solving this problem. Like just the, d- 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 I'll put it this way. I like this team a lot. Um, I don't think they're anywhere close to the worst defenders when it comes to entitlement. Uh, but that is the USA basketball way of life is like, if things aren't going well, there's just like a sense of like, oh, this doesn't fucking make any sense instead of like, you know, bearing down the hatches and like, all right, let's fucking lock, let's lock in. We got that a little bit at the start of the second half, huge third quarter uh, against Lithuania, and the guys looked a lot better. But um, the defensive effort wasn't there. the The rebounding was was atrocious. Lithuania was hitting some crazy shots. I will say, like it is, uh, as it turns out, the FIBA World Cup is also a make or miss league. Um, it's crazy, a lot of a lot of make or miss leagues out there in basketball. Um, but yeah, Lithuania was hitting everything. Uh, I'm still not super worried. Now we're gonna probably we're probably gonna play Germany. Um, Germany, Latvia play, uh, those of you listening, actually probably the game's probably already happened. It, it, it's happening tomorrow morning for us. Um, and then Canada maybe in the final. I don't know. I th- I, th- I think uh, I, I feel much less confident, obviously, after losing to Lithuania. But I just it, – it's just frustrating to me because it just, like, reiterates the, the, the cycle we get in with USA basketball where, like, nobody gives a shit about this World Cup. We lose to Lithuania. Suddenly everybody cares just to, like, point out – how embarrassing it is that we lost to Lithuania when Lithuania is not bad by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but it, it's just like the, the, the time for the, the time where the United States can just show up and win a tournament is long gone. And that is not have that is, that has been the case for a very long time that we have to play well, that we have to, we don't have to play perfect. Um, and yeah, we played, we, we responded well against Italy. I, I, I thought the guys played a lot harder. We beat the shit out of Italy. So, uh, Italy couldn't make anything. That that certainly helped. They were getting some wide open looks that they were just breaking like crazy. But um, yeah, I, I I still feel confident that we're gonna win this World Cup. But uh, yeah, I, I think I think my my concerns for United States basketball long term are valid. I I continue to be an alarmist about what is going on in in international basketball. That the United States is far too casual, far too uh, uh, just like far too comfortable sitting on the throne and we probably will sit on the throne for a little while longer but um I just don't want to be blindsided when the day comes that that we get knocked off the throne because I don't if you're forecasting what our Olympic roster looks like it is kind of bleak it is kind of bleak uh the 2024 Olympic roster that we might put together um we'll still have the most talented roster don't get me wrong. We will still have a roster when stacked up against other rosters in the Olympics. Ours will jump off the page at you. Ours will, but we do not have the. the this is not 2008. This is not. Um, this is not going to be a 2008 roster. This is not going to be a 1992 roster. 
uh, for the Olympics next year. And I just think that if if this if 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 you care about basketball and you care about this country, I think that like you should be aware of like what's happening, which is that <laughs> that the that Lithuania pizza. And th- by the way, the other thing I was thinking. The the NBA guys got all in their panties about their panties in a bunch about like uh, the uh, Noah Lyles saying that if you win, if you win an NBA championship, you're you know it's not the world champion or whatever. And they're like, yes, it is. We're the best league in the world. Lithuania didn't have a ton of NBA players, and they beat the United States, a team full of NBA players. I thought that was kind of funny that um, we just got done talking about like so like like, like there's yeah. some sort of there's some sort of idea that like if you have a team full of NBA players, that means that you are unbeatable. That is not the case. Um, that was the case in 1992 when everybody was a Hall of Famer. <laughs> it's like an absolutely loaded roster. Basically, what I'm saying, TJ, is the Dream Team ruined everything, as it turns out. I think the Dream Team is actually a net negative at this point. I think the Dream Team, I think the Dream Team for a long time was the greatest thing this country, from a sports perspective, ever ever produced. Uh, it is now coming back to bite us because we've gotten very complacent. We've gotten very used to like – if you know we've gotten very used to like putting together a roster of NBA guys and then you squint hard enough and you're like is Anthony Edwards Michael Jordan I mean I, there's literally people making memes of yeah. the half face of Anthony Edwards and Michael Jordan um and I'm I'm, I'm worried I, I legitimately am worried I, I I I'm a guy who who likes to bust out some shtick from time to time um I, this is no shtick I do think that there there will be a time in my life when the United States will enter an Olympics we will put forth the best roster we can possibly put forth and we will still not be like an uh, an obvious favorite to win the thing. I think that will happen. And I don't think it's going to happen 2024, but I think it's going to happen at some point. To your point too about people not being like not paying attention to what's happening, the biggest news coverage that I've seen or not news but social coverage of the FIBA World Cup thus far is that either Bullsack or Buttcrack Sports, <laughs> the uh, parody account on Twitter, yeah, used yeah. the loss to Lithuania as an opportunity to make a graphic that said USA Basketball eliminated from 2024 Olympic contention. Right. And people bought it. Like, it had, like, 10,000 likes, a bunch of interactions. I think Frank the Tank posted, like, a long video ranting about how, like, the USA basketball team has gone down- downhill. Like, and not only— A lot of people thought that that's what that meant because we lost the game. And not only did we not get eliminated, we actually— if, if I remember correctly, like, at that exact moment, as the clock hit zero, we actually— qualified for yeah. the olympics because dominican republic had lost and 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 however the olympic qualifying works yeah that meant that we had secured our spot yeah well because people saw so, canada uh, got in and, yeah and we <laughs> lost yeah, so they yeah. were like that must mean that we're out yeah no it's 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 it, i i don't i don't i mean i do get it but i uh, it's it, but i don't get it at the same time like i don't um it's it, usa basketball as a whole is just like a a product that people just don't give a shit about. And, and it's, it, yeah, I don't know if entitlement's probably too strong of a word, but it's just like, you know, people, people check in and, and if, if we win, you shrug your shoulders and you say, well, good, we should win. So I don't care. I'm not going to, why would I watch who do we play Germany or Latvia in the next game? We're going to blow them out by 50. Why would I yeah. watch that game? And then you, you know, Germany upsets us and then you check back in and you're like, wow, we suck. Never mind. And then like, whatever, whatever the result is, it's not a result that's going to get people to care, <laughs> you know, and like that's that's just kind of frustrating to me because I do think that like if you for if you remove like the history of basketball uh, around the world and the United States dominance in this sport and you just look to the future, I actually think it's like a compelling it it it, it the competition is there and it'll be fun and like us well, when we win the gold medal in 2024 and we will we will win the gold medal because we're better than everybody and we're going to kick their ass. Uh, but when we do, it'll be rewarding, and it won't be just like a we roll a, a bunch of guys that are our, our our second string could have won the gold medal as well. It'll be something that like we had to beat good teams along the way, kind of like 08 was. Our 08 team was so good. 2010, 2010 was that way too. Like 2010 against Spain, and Kobe takes over in the gold medal game, and like that was fun. If you anybody that watched that game, like you know, you're like this was this was great basketball. Spain was a really good team. We were better. That was a fun experience. I think that's where international basketball is now positioned moving forward where we will be the favorites. We are the, the Duke or the Kansas or, or whatever you want to call it of, of international basketball, but we still have to go out and earn it. And, uh, you know, I, 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 that should, in my mind, that should be the takeaway from Lithuania. When you lose to Lithuania in a, in a 
tournament like this, the takeaway should be like, oh, damn, the, the rest of the world actually isn't that bad. They, they're, they're, they haven't fully caught up, but they can catch us on a bad night. Yeah, of course. We got we to gotta play well every single night. Um, but instead, the takeaway is just like, well, god damn, this group of USA players sucks. Yeah. Sucks. We lost to fucking Lithuania. Ugh. Embarrassing. It, it could not possibly be that other countries are yeah. getting better. It yeah, has to it be has to be that. us, and it has to be like. Well, I'll tell you what the problem is: it's Jalen Brunson. Get his ass on the bench and yeah. get you know, give Halliburton more minutes and get you know, and and Austin Reeves was the best player on our team until the Lithuania game, and they were killing him in the low post. So now he sucks. So get him the fuck out of my face. And you know, it's like. You know, there's a world where Steve Kerr actually knows who the best the best lineup is. He's putting it out there. <laughs> We're playing decent, not great. Another team played really, really well and beat us, and that's like not shocking. That should not be shocking anymore in world basketball. But Americans continue to be shocked by it, and. Uh, I just fear like we're gonna lose our grip and we're not gonna be able to get it back, TJ. That's the fear. I I I, I will keep saying it, um, and then it'll happen, and then everyone will look at me and they'll be like, "Are you happy? You said this would happen." I'll be like, "No, I'm not happy. In fact, I'm right, but I'm not happy. This is a very sad day. A sad day for America. Sad. <laughs> I'm gonna tweet that. This is a sad day for America. Um, but we're still gonna win the World Cup. Having said all that, because we're we're just gonna win the World Cup. We're gonna beat we're gonna beat Germany. And we're gonna beat Canada, and that's gonna be that. Um. Any shout outs before we go for me? Uh, the 2023 Barstool Invitational. Oh, yeah. In yeah, Chicago, that's right. Illinois has been announced. So we hit us, hit us with the teams. Um, so they're playing it at Wintrust Arena, which yep. is where the WNBA team plays. Yep. The Chicago Sky, Sky. I believe. Sky. Yep. Um, November 8th. It's a Wednesday night. Loyola, Loyola, Chicago versus Florida Atlantic. Ooh. And Mississippi State versus Arizona State. Ooh. The. Good matchups, yeah. Initial reaction, good matchups. Florida Atlantic's going to be a top ten team. That's a that's a pretty good get for us. Um, I think Brandon and I are doing. Are, am I allowed to say that or no? I don't know what that? you're about to say. Uh, what 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 our role will be in the broadcast? Oh yeah, you can say that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I allow you to say that. Yeah, thank you, TJ. TJ is my boss, <laughs> and he okay's it. Um, I think we're doing the uh, the halftime and the desk and the in between games. Like we're we're doing the Ernie and Charles. Yep. And, and yeah, that's that's like our role and the and, and all of it. Um, but no, those are, those would be great games. Those are those are Florida Atlantic especially. That's good. That's a great get. Uh, yeah, you didn't Loyola. you obviously not obviously, but didn't go to the one in Philly last year, correct? I did not. No, it was to one of my favorite like barstool productions I've ever been a part of. <laughs> Whether you're a college basketball fan or a barstool fan, like it's a very immersive environment where like. You will get to meet people if that's what you're interested in. Like yeah. people are like mingling around, and it's like a full arena takeover. So like we have like stuff on the concourse and stuff on yeah. like the walk. Like it's a super fun environment to just be a part of. It's a very unique college basketball viewing environment too, especially if you're like, you know, an in- internal barstool fan. Yeah, but, uh, it's it's a super fun event. Definitely grab tickets if you're in the Chicago area. Come say hi. And I think those should be good. Those should be two good games. Yeah. Those are going to be two really good games. I mean Loyola. Loyola's taking a little bit of a step back, but you got to think like hometown crowd. Sister Jean gonna be there? We got to get her there. I don't know if they bring her out until the spring. <laughs> I think they they her bones are they, too cold. Yeah, she she waits. I mean, Sister Jean is a little bit of a front runner for being honest, TJ. So she might. I think this is the game. Loyola wins. Yeah. If if Loyola were to win, then Sister Jean would be at the next Loyola game. Right. That's what happens. Yeah, she doesn't come to this one. She'll wait to see if they can knock off a. Uh, Highly ranked FAU team that some people think could be top five. They'll probably be. I, I'm gonna call my shot. FAU will be ranked eleventh. Uh, I think they'll be. Oh, they'll be ranked eleventh. They'll be ranked eleventh when this thing takes place. They'll be ranked eleventh, and then we'll have to put out our own poll. We should. We should put out the Mark Titus Show poll, um, where we we go off of our own rankings. We should do that. Barstool should do that. We should put out our own rankings because you know, yeah. like that's what. That like ESPN used to do the the USA Today ESPN coaches poll mm-hmm. where they would go off of like I remember watching college basketball back in the day and like the AP poll and ESPN's poll were completely different. Yeah, and it was so confusing to watch games where they had numbers next to the teams that were not what I thought 
the AP, they weren't. They weren't what the AP yeah. poll said. That's how like wrestling, college wrestling works. It's really yeah. confusing because there's a bunch of different rankings. So we should come up with our own rankings. And if if FAU is yeah. not in the top ten, we just put them in the top ten. And then on the broadcast, you put a little like seven next to their name. Yeah, just the tightest, tightest yeah, the yeah. mostly sports vibes <laughs> ranking. Yeah. yeah, the vibes ranking. That's what we need. Uh, I want to shout out John Rostein, friend of the program, who was officially a father, as first reported by me. Uh, as a reminder, folks, I am the only trusted source in John Rostein news and John Rostein scoops. That includes John Rostein himself. So uh, do not do not listen to those other guys. Do not – whatever they have to say, it's, it's, it's false unless you hear it from me. And uh, I reported over the weekend that John Rostein's wife delivered their baby uh, Saturday night. He's officially a father. As a reminder, I reported that I, – I, I was the one who scooped that John Rostein was engaged to be married – I was the one who scooped that John Rostein, uh, his wife was pregnant with child, and he would eventually be a father. And now I'm the man who scooped that John Rostein is, in fact, a father. So shout out to John. Shout out to his, his lovely wife, who uh, I don't know if he, he ever mentions her publicly, so I won't say her name, but uh, I don't want to dox her. But she's she's I've, I've met her a few times. Great gal. Um, she's apparently healthy. The idea of John Rostein now just dealing with a crying baby in his Manhattan apartment is very funny to me um, because he's such a grinder and such a workhorse and such a robot. And now he's, his, his just life has been thrown in disarray. It's just fascinating. And I, I know he's going to love it. I know he's going to be a great dad, but like, it just kind of like, there's like a paradigm shift of how I view John, like everything just got put on tilted on its axis as I view John Rusty now. (laughs) Both and Fanta's on on his honeymoon. Fanta's on his honeymoon. That's right. (laughs) Shout out John. That's right. That's right. (laughs) On the shelf. How about that, man? How about that? That is so funny that Rusty. uh, That's a great bit that we have going. That he. I I told every time I talk to him. And, uh, well, cause what, every time I talk to him, it's basically cause I did a rant on the show about scoopers and how much I hate them. And then I always mention like, John, you're cool. And then so we'll put the clip out. Whether it's a, this, this happened at, at other companies I work for too. And they put the clip out and then John will see it and he'll call me and I'll talk to him about the scoops game. And then I'll tell him the only scoops I'm ever interested in are his own personal scoops. And he leans into that heavily and he gives me every single scoop of it. Anytime I ever get a text from John that's like, I got a scoop for you, I know exactly what's getting that, That's actually how it happened. Yeah. He texted me Saturday night and he goes, I have a scoop for you, or Sunday morning, whatever it was. He goes, I have a scoop for you. And I knew immediately what it was when he, that's all he said. He just said, I have a scoop for you. And I was like, it's going to be that he had his baby. And then I just put eyes emojis in and then he said, Meet, meet my new baby. <laughs> and I was Hell like, yeah. This is so funny. I scooped the scooper, TJ. I scooped the scooper. I, he doesn't even, he doesn't even tell people about his personal life. I have to be the one to tell him. So, you know, that's interesting. Um, shout out to, uh, there was no cur- I'm the, the, the winning time bit is dead, but I just want to shout out that show. It's a good show. And I'm going to be the bigger man, TJ. I'm going to say this. Winning time is a very good show. Uh, HBO is doing a great job. I, I very much enjoy that show every Sunday night. And, uh, as it turns out, it, it is apparently something that I also enjoy that nobody else is watching. Uh, throw that in with the feeble world cup, but I'm, I'm having a great time watching it. Unfortunately, no one else seems to be watching it. But uh, I feel like uh, the if they would have made this a movie, they would have like five Oscar nominations out of this show. <laughs> the acting's yeah. incredible. Jason Segel's incredible. Adrian Brody is incredible. Uh, the dude that plays Jerry West, what's his name? Like Jason Clark or something like that. I want to say um, he's incredible. John C. Riley's incredible. Like the whole the whole the show is incredible. Nobody cares. Nobody seems to be yeah. watching it. It seems to have just like lost all of its. Momentum. It's My hang up with the with the show is that it is costing us future John C. Riley and Will Ferrell movies. That's right. I don't know if you know that, I do story. know the story. Yeah, that's just that's. I don't think that that era of comedy plays anymore. Mm-hmm. Like there hasn't been a movie like that. For those that don't know, Adam McKay co-created Winning Time. Will Ferrell thought he was going to get the lead role. John right. C. Riley got it instead. Will Ferrell essentially said, you guys are dead. Not only did Will Ferrell think he was going to get it, it was like Will Ferrell yes. badly wanted it, and this was like a dream of his to play because he's a Lakers fan, and he's wanted to play, apparently. I don't know. That's how the story goes. He's so to this play was Jerry like, yeah, yeah, this was the opportunity, and it didn't happen, and now like Will Ferrell's like, yeah, we're not We're, we're not, not cool anymore. anymore. Yeah. So like, there will be no more Talladega Knights. There will be no it's more Step Brothers. There will be no more Anchor Anchorman. But. And there will be no That's Mark. Life. And there will be no Mark Titus acting career because of this show as well. Right. So I mean, it's think you of all. You and Will Ferrell. Maybe of, we should, should put a show. Yeah, we should do a show. Yeah. I'll have, if if I ever, I actually was on a plane uh, with Will Ferrell 
uh, from from uh, L.A. to New York once, and I, I I sat behind him a couple rows. And now, like, if had that flight happened, you know, say like a month from now, TJ, I would have had something to talk to him about. Yeah. I would have been like, "What's up, Will?" Just uh, wondered. Wanted to all wanted to say I've also been personally affected by from one time. <laughs> from <yeah>. one time. <laughs> Damn shit. Uh, are you? Last thing I have. Are you on like a salad diet? What's going on here? Yeah, What's this? Seen, been yeah, I've been I've been peeping the tweets, dude. I, What's uh, going on? So I I moved last week, and I figured like if I'm gonna make one monumental lifestyle change, might as well make another one on top of that. Yeah, and try and like better my life. So I've just been like. Just like crushing no, salads. No lactose, limited carbs, intermittent fasting. Let's go. Skincare routine. Let's go, TJ. I TJ a, Glow I Up. A big mirror. Let's go, dude. Mirrors are good. Lamp, mirrors are. Two, I bought two lamps. I wow. had no lamps before that. Wow. So, y'all, y'all mind if I fuck around and <laughs> become my best self? <laughs> and I'm not doing it for anybody. I'm doing it for me. Do it for you, man. The glow up is real. I'm I'm I, I would love this. This would be fantastic. I, I'm I'm rooting for it. Any way I can support this, um, th- there are a lot of bad influences at this company. I want yes. I want to be a good influence <laughs> on you, TJ. I want to be, I want you to, uh, yeah. yeah I uh, you're safe in my arms. Just come 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 run to me if you yeah. feel like you're being pressured to house an entire box of pizza oh, by yeah. some <laughs> some of these people here. Yeah, you did uh, it. You I were, did do you it. You were a big fellow at one point. I was a big fella, and uh, I I but my I had to. Uh, I, I had to get out of the Midwest right. to, to, to lose it. So <laughs> you're stepping into the Midwest, hoping to lose. But I, I support it. Um, one of my visions, w- one of my pitches for Barstool is I want to launch Barstool Fitness. Yeah, that's one of the brands I want to launch here, just because I think those two words next to each other is like the funniest thing ever. Like the, <laughs> the idea of like us selling merch that just says Barstool Fitness. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we got it. We got to You could be the poster boy for this. Yeah. I Because I, I want to. I want to. I want a, uh, a an umbrella that exists here, a brand umbrella where it's it's just like when Mincy's training for his 10K, he does it under the barstool fitness umbrella. Um, when Billy Football is trying to bench press like 400 pounds when he hasn't lifted in a little while, right. but he's like, "Did you challenge me? Fuck it, I'll do it. Put it on the bar." Yeah, we 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 film that under the barstool fitness. Just everything would be so funny to me. The idea I of a barstool say fitness umbrella. There was at one point an ad deal. That revolved around like a office weight loss competition, <laughs> and they had to like scrap it because the group that was supposed to lose weight did not, or like they gained weight over like the two weeks or something. <laughs> so they had to like rework that ad deal. So it's been attempted, it's not been very attempted, successfully. Yeah. Well, maybe this could be the start of it. Do, do you feel like you you got a good start on it? Do you feel yeah. like you're, you're going well like, for you? Like I said, like one big change. Yeah. Just lump in changing what I'm eating into living in a new city. What's the hardest? Like, no, nah, I'm not what, thinking about it. What's the hardest thing for you? Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm working on more changes too. I want to get better at waking up earlier. I'm bad at that. Wow. Which I have to now because mostly sports. Wow. Look at this. This is incredible. I'm gonna become a fucking beast. <laughs> You're gonna become. This is. This is. Uh, Watch out. This is. This is gonna be fantastic. That's awesome. Well, good for you, man. Uh, I'm uh, very earnest. Uh, wish you well, and uh, that would be awesome. Uh, thank you, to Ryan Konigsberg, for uh, for for imparting some knowledge on Colorado football, and uh, thank you to everybody watching and listening. We will be back Friday. The schedule's been shifted, uh, so obviously this came out on Wednesday. Um, we're going to be back Friday. Maybe a little NFL stuff. I need to I need to dip my toes in the NFL waters because uh, I. I need. I, I'm gonna try to get an NFL guy on the show to just like. I, I might just talk about Justin Fields for an hour. That might be what the show is. But I, I'm very very excited about the NFL this year, and uh, we have not really done much NFL stuff on this, uh, this program. But NFL starting up this weekend, so we'll see you guys Friday.